You are on, sir. Okay, so I would like to call to order the Finance Committee meeting of March 1st, 2021 at approximately 5.01 p.m. Can I have a roll call, please? Yes, you can. Uh, Councilor Cassett Sanchez. Here. Councilor Villarreal. Present. Councilor Lindell. Here. Councilor Romero Worth. I'm here. And Councilor Beta. Here. You have a quorum, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay, the first item is approval of the agenda. Are there any changes from staff? No changes, Mr. Chair. Okay, any changes from the committee on the agenda itself? Can I have a motion regarding the agenda? Move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can I have a roll call, please? Councilor Cassett Sanchez? Yes. Councilor Villarreal? Yes. Councilor Lindell? Yes. Councilor Romero Worth? Yes. Councilor Beta? Yes. Okay, yes. so the agenda has been approved and we have approval of the consent agenda. Um, are there items to be removed from the consent agenda? Uh, Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item B is in boy for discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Lindell. Item F also. Okay. Any other items to be removed from the consent? Okay, so I've got item B and item F. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda with those uh, with that amendment? Move to approve this amendment. Second. Okay, can I have a roll call, please? Yes, Councilor Cassett Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Villarreal. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Romero Worth? Yes. Councilor Beta? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, then we are on to approval of the minutes, the Finance Committee meeting minutes of February 15th, 2021. Are there any changes from staff? No changes, Mr. Chair. Changes from the committee. Move to approve. We have second. a motion and a second. Uh, can I have a roll call, please? Councilor Cassett Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Villarreal. Yes. Councilor Lindell. Yes. Councilor Romero Worth. Yes. Councilor Beta. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, then we are on to item six, which is presentations. The first being a debt financing options presentation, uh, geo bond, GRT bonds, enterprise bonds. Uh, and it, the presentation will be made by uh, Bradley Fletch. Bradley. Mr. Chair, before Bradley begins, I just want to give an outline of what the uh, finance committee will be, what we will be reviewing with the finance committee over the month of March. Uh, today, our first meeting of March, we're gonna be doing a debt overview. Uh, part one uh, of GEO bonds, GRT bonds, and enterprise bonds will be going into uh, you know, what exactly is uh, are each of these tools, uh, how can they be used, what is the timeline, who approves them, um, and then standing for any questions that you have. On March 22nd, we will be doing a second uh, debt overview uh, presentation on different financing options that we have alluded to through other presentations, things like uh, the alphabet soup, right? The IRBs, LIDA, uh, PIDs, TIDs, uh, anything of that nature. So uh, we have that to look forward to at our next meeting on the 22nd. So with that, I'll turn it over to Brad to do um, some introductions uh, for, our, uh, for the agenda this evening's presentation and some introductions of the uh, staff that we have uh, here with you as well. Okay, great, thank you. Brad. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, good evening, Chairman, Councilors. Um, so tonight we're just really gonna introduce the bond team. 
Uh, we're going to go over GRT bonds, some legal background, what we have outstanding, what are the, you know, uh, our capacity, um, answer some of those questions. We're going to look at GO bonds, same thing. What is the statutory background, uh, capacity, what we can do. Uh, we'll discuss enterprise bonds and other bond overview. Uh, and then uh, hopefully we've attached the uh, debt policy um, and it should be made available to you. Or if it's not, if you haven't already received it, it will be available to you shortly. So uh, first we have uh, our bond counsel from Modril Sperling, Peter Franklin, um, and uh, our municipal advisor um, is Hilltop Securities uh, led by George Williford. Um, the other final person is our underwriter, um, and we select them as needed. Uh, typically a bank, um, we've seen the uh, solar energy and streetlight project working through, and in this case, the placement agent is D.A. Davidson. And so uh, with that, we're going to start right on to the bonds, gross receipts tax. Um, some background on it. Uh, the city plans to issue a GRT bond back in FY22. Um, typically we match the city's issuance capacity with the city's ability to manage projects, design, planning, and implementation. Um, we use the uh, GRT to uh, address the backlog of repair, maintenance of existing facilities, infrastructure, and then provide new capital for new investment uh, to improve sustainability and energy efficiency. Um, one of the objectives is, is maintaining a interesting, you know, a, a, a comfortable level of debt service. We have a chart uh, a bit longer um, later on that really shows how close we got to um, our debt service capacity, um, not because we borrowed too much, but because revenues dropped significantly because of COVID. Uh, COVID. So, you know, uh, who are the bondholders, you know, uh, you know, they, and what do they own and what's protecting them? What is a senior lien? What is a subordinate lien? The, the first and most very important part of uh, understanding what our capacity is in GRT is to uh, understand pledge revenues it also determines exactly what revenues the bondholders have a claim on. Uh, so in this case, you know, GRT bondholders have no claim on water revenues or geo bond revenues or property tax or lodgers tax. They only have these pledged revenues. These are unaudited FY20 numbers. kind of a graphical representation, um, giving you a balance. This is total GRT. The whole bar is total GRT. Pledged is blue, uh, non-pledged, you know, which is, you know, we haven't pledged to the creditors is in uh, orange. This is the interesting chart I was talking about. You can see the dip in this fiscal year, how close we got the difference between the blue bar and the orange line is what I'm looking at. But as you can see, the blue bar, which is total debt service for GRT, declining through time. And this is a real important takeaway, is the difference between the blue bar and the orange line is the city's debt capacity. It's not in measured in how much we can borrow it's measured in how much debt service we can pay annually. So when you look at here, we've got roughly say, you know, maybe $4 million difference between pledged revenue or, you know, uh, pledged revenues and debt service. But as time goes on, debt service is paid and yet we're projecting, you know, slow stable growth of GRT into the future with this. These are the outstanding issues for debt service, what we've used it for in the past and their size 
and uh, to what departments they're given to. Senior lien has the first claim on pledged revenues. Uh, subordinate lien has the second claim. Here's a historic, oops, historic use. And so Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you wanna stop at each bond type or, or to answer questions, or if you wanna move through the entire presentation. Now let, let's stop at each bond type. So I'll start with questions um, and then go to the committee. The, uh, you had said in FY22, we're looking at uh, a GRT bond. Uh, when in FY22 and how much are you proposing? I can go ahead and fill that one. Uh, we are, as the slides have said, uh, we are really looking at uh, the progress of our current GRT bonds. I believe Regina presented to Public Works Committee last uh, week about the status of our current FY20 or our 2018 GRT bond, and then the capacity, the staff capacity that we would have as those projects continue to progress uh, in a timely manner and are coming to a completion. Uh, so we will likely be doing that at some point in the second half of FY22, issuing a, a, another GRT bond uh, to the tune of 20 million. Okay, great. Okay, uh, questions from the committee. Um, I see Councillor Garcia and Councillor Rivera are with us. Did you have any questions regarding uh, this GRT bond specifically? None for me, Mr. Chair. This is Councillor Garcia. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rivera. Uh, none for me. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, Brad, let's go ahead and move on to the next topic. Our next topic is general obligation bonds. Um, general obligation bonds are full faith and credit of the city. Um, and what does that mean? Um, a thank you, council. Um, general obligation debt holders, the people who we borrow money from, have recourse to the city's ad valorem property tax taxing authority that they can tax without limitation as to rate or amount in order to cover the debt. Uh, that's full faith and credit. And so um, that's why they're highly rated, uh, desirable by investors. Uh, geo bonds must be approved by the voters of Santa Fe. That's another reason why they're liked by investors is because the, city's, the citizens are committed to paying for this service. A uh, geo bond repaid with property tax, and that's specific to New Mexico uh, statute. Um, Residential uh, customers pay one mill rate. Um, commercial uh, property pays a different mill, mill rate. Um, the Department of Finance and Administration, New Mexico Finance and Administration, sets the mill rate to cover the debt service annually. Um, currently, for the last few years, you know, you can watch, you know, the property values increase. We've went from roughly 4.1 billion in assessed property value in the city to roughly 4.5 billion in assessed property value. That's $400 million of new taxable property. And so um, we also have a, a thing called yield maintenance. And anyway, our mill rate has dropped, our debt service mill rate has dropped from roughly 0.78 or seven, yeah, 0.78 mills to 0.38 mills over the last three years. Uh, our debt service mill rate has dropped. Um, operational mill rate has remained constant. Um, borrowing capacity of geo bonds is set by the state of New Mexico. I'd mentioned the four and a half billion. It's 4% of that four and a half billion less outstanding debt. Uh, so the city has the ability to borrow roughly 164 million in general obligations by statute. We have three outstanding general obligation bonds. The 2019 actually is a refunding of the 2010 GEO bond. Uh, we refunded that last fiscal year. 
uh, saved roughly 50,000 a year until maturity. Uh, the G, uh, 2013, 2014 GEO bond. This is a, uh, a chart of general obligation bond um, debt service. Um, in this case, what we were looking at is, uh, and this is thanks to Hilltop Securities, they were the ones that ran these numbers for me, um, is so if the city was to issue a $10 million general obligation bond in 20 year term, 25 year term or 30 year term, how much would the annual debt service be? And we did that for both 10, 15 and $20 million general obligation bonds. And what we have is the table of about what the annual debt service would be at three and a half percent interest. Putting into that into the context of the property owners, and this is for the residential property owners. Yes. And so this is what you could expect uh, if the city was to issue a $10 million general obligation bond. And just fill everything that you have funded and then we'll figure out the rest. Great. Thank you, Jim. I'm so glad you're done. Kira, Kira you're, yeah. on, you're on mute. So we just heard a little bit I'm of your- I'm sorry. Time. No problem. So uh, this is the impact of a, a $10 million a GEO bond on property tax. And you have property value, taxable property value, which is by statute one third of property value. And then this would be the increase per year. So if you had a, a, a $300,000 home, its taxable value is 100,000. And with a 20 year, uh, a $10 million 20 year maturity, that would be $15 and 22 cents a year for 20 years. Um, for 25 year maturity, it'd be $13 and 39 cents. And then for a, a 30 year maturity, it's $12. And we calculated this for both the 10 year or 10 million, uh, 15 million, and $20 million gross uh, uh, general obligation bond. And that completes general obligation bonds, Mr. Chairman. Uh, open for questions. Okay, so Brad, on general obligation bonds, uh, so if we say we do 10 million, then if you go to that slide with, uh, we, then at, like you said, a property valued at 300,000, they would be, uh, their tax bill would increase by $15 and 52 cents a year if we do the 20 year maturity. That is correct. But we can choose the maturity, but we land up paying back more. That was the previous slides that you had showed us, right? That is correct. Okay, and then, uh, at, like I remember from Santa Fe County and then we see it with the, the public schools, they, they try to have a, a geo bond uh, renewal every two years. And so would we be able to do the same thing and potentially get uh, 10 million every two years? And would that, would that 1552 stay the same if we did that? The 1552 would stay the same for this bond. And, and again, much like we've seen with the mill rate going down, it, you know, if property values continue to go up, the impact of this will, will be going down. The mill rate will be going down. So the property value is going up, the mill rate's going down. It should approximate that same amount for the life of the bond. You add a second bond, you would be adding an additional fifteen dollars. You add what if a we just, bond. Okay. Well, what if what what about when they say this is just a renewal of the bond and it's not going to affect your property tax? What do they mean by that? When like the public schools that do that, they have an old bond maturing, 
would be one reason where that would happen okay. because they're just replacing that outstanding capital. Okay. So we would have to see what, which of our bonds, old bonds would be maturing. And right now we only have three of them, right? A 2013. And then what were the other two? A 2014 and a 2019. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, other questions from the committee regarding geo bonds? Mr. Chair. Yes, Councilwoman Romero Worth. Um, so, Brad, when, when the public schools issue a geo bond, and to the chairman's question, and they, how often do they come? Do you know how often they come back and say, we're just renewing? So, your property taxes aren't going up. We're just going to keep, I mean, are they working with the same time periods that we are? these 20 years, 25 years, 30 years? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Council Romero Worth, um, I'd like to get back to you on that. Um, when you look at the property tax certificate, the school district has a lot of, of, of different increments of property tax. They have the, edu or the computer piece, they have construction piece. You know, we have operational, and debt service. And so they can have different varieties of geo bonds and, and the way their revenue streams work. So um, I will have to get back to you on that. Okay, because I think, um, I, don't think I don't think they're working in the same time frame that you're outlining here because they co they've come back, it seems, well, I know they've come back uh, on the computer one twice and it hasn't been 20 years, hasn't been 25 years. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. And, and when Albuquerque did theirs for their affordable housing trust fund, what kind of a time frame were they on? Because they come back more frequently, it seems like too. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor Romero Worth, um, on that I have to get back to you too. It could be the same issue that we've had you know, that there's an expansion in property value, thus increasing the capacity. Because again, their property value is going up. What the school district assesses on is going up exactly like ours. It's the same property. Brad, so there could be growth of capacity too. Brad, this is George. Do you mind if I interject? Uh, please do, George. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, Councillor Romero Worth, uh, most of the cities and schools that have what is really a rolling general obligation program, uh, it's modeled specifically and, and created accordingly. And a couple of things. First, each issue generally will have a shorter repayment term than, than the 20 years that's been discussed here. And then based on kind of a targeted levy amount, uh, the initial issues will be front end loaded. And what they do is then every couple of years, that it's kind of a fill solution they'll try to issue. Now, you can uh, reach an ultimate capacity after a series of issuances if you're not uh, careful, but that it's, it's a structure that has to be specifically modeled toward that rolling type program. So if that is something we could do, Yes, uh, Councillor, uh, if asked, we could help Brad and, and Mary model out a uh, uh, conceptual rolling type program, you know, based on a specific levy target. Because I, th I think, Mr. Chairman, it would be important for us to understand if, if we had a rolling program, what people's property tax increases might look like and uh, how that works rather than these really long um, time periods that we're looking at right now. Uh, I agree. And I would just give direction to start working on that. Unless somebody from the finance committee feels strongly <laughs> against it. I think we should get started working on that. So we have that information at one of our upcoming meetings. Yeah, I just, I, I will, uh, you know, I, I think, Again, this is all informational so that we understand what tools we have in our toolbox. Um, 
so hopefully as the economy recovers and uh, we come out of the economic crisis we're in, uh, we, we know what kind of tools we might have to address some of the longer standing issues we have in this community. I don't, I'm not sure that I'm interested in putting any of these things in practice tomorrow, but I would like to know what our options are and uh, what that looks like for both the city and uh, the, the taxpayers. Uh, you, anything Mr. else? Chair. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On um, the question about these scenarios, so the estimated property tax increase, say for the 10 million geo bond, those amounts say for like the property value of 200,000, the 20 year maturity, 25 maturity, 30 year maturity, are those amounts like 1034, 830, 893 and $8? Is that what individual households get increased? Is that their increase on their bill? That would be the increase on, you know, their property, you know, being assessed by the county valued by the county, collected by the county. Okay. And then the county distributes back to us. I see, okay. And then the question that Council, Councilwoman Rometta Worth brought up about rolling program for a geo bond, is that what Albuquerque currently does to fund their, I think it's called the Workforce Act or something like that, Workforce Housing Act, or I can't remember exact name of it. But I'm just curious if that was a rolling program. Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Villarreal, I'll have to get back to you with an answer on that, but you know, I will look into it and find out. And Councilwoman Rometta Worth, was that what you were thinking for a rolling program? Is that the one, is that a model that you're saying Albuquerque has currently? Yeah, they, they do something that f uh, with their geo bond, I believe, that funds their affordable housing trust fund or. Right. The, something yeah I don't know if they call it the same thing but they call it like workforce housing act or something but i was just curious if that rolling model is what they had and you just confirm that um thank you um the other question i had actually had to do with the grt um i forgot to ask you earlier on page 11 it says historic use of GRT debt capacity. Um, and it says, it talks about the last bullet point, governing body has full discretion to use GRT bond proceeds for any purpose allowed by law. And then the last bullet, sub bullet says, the governing body does not have authority to use proceeds in a manner inconsistent with the bond ordinance authorizing issuance of the bonds. Although it could amend the bond ordinance to use proceeds for some other legal purpose outside of the authorized bond um, purpose. So can you explain that a little bit more or say more about that and maybe give an example? Brad, um, would you like me to jump in here on that? Yes, I would. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman and Councillor Villarreal, um, normally in a gross receipts tax bond ordinance, we use very generic language for what the purpose of, or what, what the use of the bond proceeds will be. I mean, it's things like, you know, designing, acquiring, constructing, improving public facilities, which, which is awfully broad. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's a little bit difficult to come up with a, an example of, you know, what would actually go outside that extremely broad way of describing the purposes. But um, when the legislature de-earmarked the um, all the or most of the local option gross receipts taxes and said that they could be used for any governmental purpose, theoretically you could use bond proceeds for things that aren't even capital projects at this point. They couldn't be tax exempt under federal law, but um, the, that language has even, has very dramatically um, opened up what 
gross receipts taxes and gross receipts tax revenue bonds could be used for. So that would be an example. I mean, if the, if the city, for example, wanted to fund um, affordable housing services or something like that, uh, that's, that's a governmental purpose. And that's not, that wouldn't fit into the way we usually describe, um, <clears throat> you know, the purpose of the bonds and the bond ordinances. I, I guess I would complicate this one step further by saying once bonds have been issued and they've been issued on a tax exempt basis, you wouldn't be able to change the purposes of the bonds in such a way that it would um, make the, the interest on the bonds taxable. Um, that would violate covenants to bondholders. So what do you, what would you think, um, you gave an example about affordable housing initiatives. Um, do you know of other places that have done that in New Mexico? Or maybe I, not just affordable housing, but other, other options for the bonds to use the proceeds in another way, um, other than what you said about the generic language? Well, I mean, for example, Santa Fe County has changed the use of proceeds of bonds after the bonds were already issued to go from one capital purpose to another because the bonds were issued, you know, I just, to, I, I don't actually recall right now, but um, for example, bonds issued to acquire open space, if there, I, I think there may have been less open space available than had previously been thought. So the bond ordinance was amended to enable the use of the proceeds for some other capital purpose. Got it, thank you for that example. I'm just curious about that more in terms of what are the pros and cons of doing that? It's hard to determine based on the presentation, but just curious if there was ways to like look at that more in detail to look at pros and cons of amending bond ordinances. I, I guess what I would say is you, often there are unforeseen consequences of amending existing ordinances. Um, you know, it's something we'd want to look at on a case by case basis. Um, and especially after bonds have already been issued and it would just, if the bonds are issued tax exempt, it would really be important not to amend the ordinance in a way that could um, um, negatively affect the tax exempt status of the bonds. Got it. Thank you for that information, Mr. Franklin. That's Thank all. Okay, uh, going back to geo bonds, uh, Brad, you had talked about how the num uh, the value of of homes and properties or uh, would affect the uh, what gets paid or what's charged in property taxes. Does the the number of homes have an effect also? Because I mean, we've seen a lot of homes that are under construction right now. What kind of effect does that have on what you pay back or what we charge the uh, property owners to pay up on back? Uh, Mr. Chair, it would be, you know, you, that 4.5 billion um, growing each year would represent all the new homes, all the new apartment buildings, all the new commercial space would be included as long as it was taxable. You know, when they built, you know, Presbyterian Hospital being a tax exempt property, it's not in that number, that 4.5 billion. But as we see development over the years, that could also affect our ability to, to I guess I would think to roll, to do your rolling program, right? If you have a, a certain growth that helps. You would be growing the tax base. And so you would be spreading the fixed cost of the debt service over a larger and larger base over time. Okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, Councilor Garcia, did you have any questions on uh, geo bonds? No questions, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Rivera. 
I have no questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions on geo bonds, uh, let's move to the next topic, Brad. Um, enterprise debt. Um, and in this case, uh, the water department, it has three outstanding issues. Uh, the water department is AAA rated by Fitch, AA plus by Standard and Poor's. Um, the uh, wastewater, it's a standalone credit. The important thing is it's a standalone credit. It can issue debt on its own revenues. Um, wastewater and, and both um, water and wastewater were affirmed uh, late last year by Fitch in, as AA pluses. Um, the wastewater um, has one specific bond outstanding as a standalone entity. That's the uh, digester bond, green bond. And then transit um, has a 2014 fleet uh, with NMFA. And in that, this case, transit receives 90% um, of one of the uh, municipal increments. I believe it might be increment four. And um, of that, they pledged a portion of that for this debt. This, and so it's outside of pledged revenues, but transit pledged this part of their municipal GRT for this loan. Other debt outstanding, um, the city, you know, the convention center refinanced its bond in uh, June, 2015. The, um, it matures in uh, 2035. And in this case, we use the uh, lodger's tax is 7%. 5% is lodger's tax, 2% is uh, convention center fee. We use the 2% convention center fee for this debt service on the convention center bond. We also have a, a fire equipment note with the NMFA. They intercept uh, the debt service when the state fire marshal uh, makes his distribution semi-annually. And then environmental services has a, a cart bond uh, with NMFA. Here's a quick picture of enterprise debt. You can see the gray, you know, transit ends in 2026. All of them are ended by June, 2039. So um, other than that, you know, enterprise debt, um, answer any questions or just, I have two more quick slides, just to recap. Uh, gross receipt stacks are approved by the governing body. Uh, city pledges a portion of gross receipts tax revenues as collateral. Uh, general obligation bonds are paid for by property tax and approved by the city or citizens of the city. Enterprise revenue bonds are water and wastewater. Um, and standalone credits, and it's based on their revenue streams as businesses. And Mr. that concludes Chair. our presentation. Mr. Chair? Yes, Councilwoman Romero-Worth. Uh, Brad, what kind of capacity do we have on the enterprise bonds? Do you have any idea? Well, in the Fitch rating in November, they did say that the water and wastewater utilities were under leveraged meaning uh, given their revenues, they could support more debt. But they also carry um, large cash balances, both of them. And do we have to use those for particular things? The are cash they restricted? balances? No, the, the enter enterprise bonds, are they restricted to the, to the uh, cash balances that back them up? Um, well, they're restricted, you know, their repayment is based on the revenues of the utility. Um, and the use of the bond proceeds would be restricted to that utilities, either capital or equipment needs. Okay, so that's, that's kind of important. But we set much like our, our GRT bonds you know, we set, okay, what is an appropriate debt limit? And um, George would be more than able, and I can get back to you on this too. 
But, you know, we sort of say, you know, we want to maintain a double A plus or a triple A rating. What do the financials have to look like? What does the debt service, meaning we would like to see, um, you know, debt service and have revenues like five times, five times debt service is better than two times debt service. And so if you want to be AAA, you need to be X debt service. But if you're AA plus, you can set a lower um, multiple. And I, Mr. Chairman, I, I have to imagine that those, that the utilities have plans for whatever bonding capacity they have as they look at their infrastructure needs and deferred maintenance and what's required to, to keep our infrastructure operating at the level that it needs to. So right, sure. and I think, right, and I think that's kind of the setup of the next presentation on our agenda is kind of their financial framework and how that ultimately will lead into what you're suggesting. Okay. Um, uh, Brad, if, it, if possible, I'd, I'd like to have a copy of this presentation. I can distribute this, no problem. Right. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Okay. Uh, questions from uh, the committee? Or the uh, counselors, Councillor Garcia or Councillor Rivera? Mr. Chair? Yes, Councillor Rivera. Yeah, I just wanted to ask Brad or maybe Peter um, if uh, if we did a, a bond um, and uh, the water department, I think, is recommending that we don't do any uh, rate increases for five years under current situations. Uh, if we did a bond, uh, could that potentially lead to increased uh, or an increase in rates sooner than later? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, uh, Councilor Rivera, I think I will leave that to the people following me. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll leave that to Shannon <laughs> and his financial analyst. Brad, could I uh, venture oh, please do, a Peter. very quick response? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Rivera, um, most likely the any debt issued by the water utility or the wastewater utility would have to be sized um, around the current rates or around rates that are, you know, uh, strongly anticipated to be put into place uh, in, in the near term. Um, but assuming the debt would be sized to current rates, the, the only way that rates could go up is if water usage or wastewater usage goes down or there are declines in the amount of revenue available to pay debt service. In that case, the city, the, the ordinances include covenants that the city will increase the rates to the extent necessary to pay the debt service. But if it's um, sized properly and, you know, there are no um, unanticipated declines in the use of the utility services, um, that would be unlikely to happen. Yeah, so at a presentation at Public Works, they um are recommending uh, increases uh, probably at five years. We don't have to do that right now, but uh, five years from now, we may. If we issue bonds sooner than that, will that affect, or if we touch the cash balances, will that affect, um, will that affect um, uh, fees that uh, uh, customers have to pay? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Councillor Rivera, uh, again, if the bonds are sized, you know, to be payable based on the current rates, um, that should not be necessary. If, if they're sized with a, um, in other words, if, if the city decides to issue a, a, a greater amount of debt 
because it's anticipating increasing the rates in five years, that would, I, 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 think, it, I think that would probably be hard to do. I mean, I've seen utility bonds issued where there was already a rate increase approved, but that ha had not yet been implemented. But um, I, I think it would be very hard to sell bonds uh, based on based on rates that you know are predicted to increase five years from when the bonds are issued. That I think I think investors would think that was not necessarily a very good bet. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for this presentation, yeah. Brad. It would Mr. be, uh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, sorry about that. Councillor Garcia. Uh, I just wanted to ask if uh, Brad wouldn't mind sending that presentation to the entire governing body. Uh, Mr. Chair, councillors, I just sent that uh, email to the entire governing body with the attachment. So you have that uh, to review at your leisure. Okay, great. Thank you. And, uh, and again, uh, Brad and Mary, if you can start putting together that uh, rolling program for us, because I think there was a lot of questions regarding what other entities are doing with that, because we always hear or see where on election day, vote for this, it won't result in a property tax increase. And we seem to see it more than uh, just every 10 or 15, 20 years, we, it, sometimes it feels like it's every two years or four years for sure. So it'd be interesting to see how they're doing that. Thank you. Okay, so our next presentation is the financial framework of the enterprise funds within the public utilities department. Uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Finance Committee, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, what you have in your package is a memo with a data table that was shared with the Public Works Public Utilities Committee um, last week, and also a supplemental memo. Uh, there's a request for additional information, more specific to GRT um, in the utilities. <clears throat> um, so at the request of the chair, uh, this, 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 this was included in the packet. Um, I think a brief outline of the memo, um, <clears throat> really what I think the focal point is, is the data cards that were provided. Um, so these are utility perspectives on numbers uh, from the utilities, um, really as an informational to the governing body, things like uh, projected revenues, um, operating costs, um, <clears throat> any cash restrictions, along with um, some CIP expenditures, and then um, any side notes, things like um, cost of other city departments, franchise fees. Um, so really just a shot at bringing some data forward to kind of paint a picture. Um, so again, in utilities, uh, balancing revenues over expenses um, is, is one of the factors that really dictates the, the rates and how the financial structure and framework is, is achieved. Um, in addition, things like cash balance, uh, being able to meet those reserves and having enough cash balance to fund uh, CIP projects in addition to debt service um, in that capacity. So in the last presentation, it was alluded to where the city sets a, a debt service cap, um, say like one and a half or two times um, <clears throat> the, the capacity and so really limits the utility up so that they don't exceed um, a debt capacity. When you look at the rate structure, those are all things in the financial plan that dictate when, if and when a rate increase will occur. Um, so any of those could trigger, so if cash balances are projected to fall below acceptable levels, uh, that could trigger a rate increase. If debt capacity is exceeding the threshold set by the governing body, that could trigger a rate increase uh, to lower that debt capacity. And of course, if, if revenues fall below expenditures, Again, that could also trigger a rate increase. So balancing all of these through uh, is all the work that we do in, in our financial plan. Uh, Five-year financial plan that we update annually is looking at all of these factors. There was some discussion around bonds, um, if I could, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, just shed a little bit of light. I do have uh, both Marcos Martinez from the city attorney's office and Jason Mum, our financial consultant, available as well. But ultimately, when we have large projects, 
Um, bonds uh, are part of the are part of the equation, and we do evaluate that for our projects. Um, and it takes a look at a, at a couple of factors. One is cash balances. Um, right? Does the utility have the cash to fund the CIP? And if they use the cash, what is the long-term impact of using the cash for that specific project? Um, if there's a benefit of using the bonds, whether um, we think that there's a market that may provide a better rate, or if the project um, has a longer life cycle so that the people actually paying for the project um, aren't using the cash available now, but is uh, dispersed over the next 20 years for the people who are actually using the asset. Um, our typical conversations around when we would do a bond. I think I would also take an opportunity to uh, paint a picture of looking at cash balances and debt capacity. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard um, at one point in time, the water division having $95 million in cash. Um, I think there's some people that still believe that that's true, but ultimately, if you rewind back to, I believe around 2016, um, there was a significant amount of cash, about 95 million, but the amount of debt that the utility had was um, significant. It was more than what we carry now. So a decision was made by the governing body to reduce cash balances and pay off some of that debt. So as we lowered the cash balances from the water division, we created that debt capacity. Um, so really it's just a, a conscientious decision, a financial decision of, of when, do you, when do you want the cash um, available as a balance and when do you want the ability to borrow money and not be on either end of the spectrum where you're completely totally in debt uh, with no wiggle room or that you've uh, used all your debt and you're just sitting on cash that you're um, trying to push out um, through projects. Uh, so I'm gonna stop with that. Um, again, my intent was just to share some informational um, information about the uh, public utilities and their financial framework, having uh, my support staff available to answer any questions along with myself. And I will end with that, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Um, so uh, looking at the memo you provided to Public Works on February 12th, uh, and then attached to it, you have uh, your service data cards. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first thing that I noticed when I looked at the different uh, service data cards, like for example, environmental service, you have an annual projected revenue of 15 million and an annual operating cost of 13.4 million. Then wastewater, you've got uh, projected revenue of 16 million and operating costs of 14.5 million. So between those two, there's a difference of about 1.5, 1.6 million. But when you go to water, you have a $36 million uh, annual projected revenue, but only a $25 million operating cost. So that's an $11 million a year difference. Is, is there a reason why we go so close to the projected revenues with environmental and, and wastewater, uh, but when it comes to water, we don't, and we have that big gap of 11 million? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the question. Um, my immediate reaction would be is also, if you, if you look at the CIP spending between the utilities, um, Water Division, right, probably has an $87 million CIP, five-year CIP plan, where environmental services is probably more around the um, maybe 10 to $12 million five-year plan. And so the cash balances needed in order to support that CIP is really the main drive between the difference in revenue and expenditures, that capacity um, of inflow of cash is to support the CIP. Okay. Um, and then looking at the water division data card, uh, when you look at your cash reserves or restrictions, you have a 365 day operating reserve and then of 24 million and then an emergency reserve of 4 million. What's the difference between those two reserves? Because uh, to, to me, they, they sound like they're the same thing. So why would you need both? Uh, Mr. Chair, my response to that would be um, the, the 365 day operating reserve uh, again goes back to our recommendation through our financial consultants on um, setting that reserve for operating cash um, has a direct effect on your on your bond reading, your, your credit rating. So again, why water is double A plus plus partly is because they carry a 365 day operating cash reserve. The emergency reserve was set by a different ordinance on a different threshold, which really speaks specifically to if there was an emergency, um, 
that that the utility would have this funding set aside to address just the emergency with operating cash is tied more to um, like a credit rating. Okay. Um, and then I'd see the same thing with, you've got a capital reserve of 3 million, but then a capital replacement reserve of 3 million. So what's the difference between those two? What are the purposes of, of, of those? Cause they sound the same. Um, uh, yes, Mr. Chair. So um, I think very close. Um, so capital reserve, I would say, is more a planned, um, a planned execution of like an asset management plan of um, capital assets coming to the end of their life cycle, something like a water main replacement um, as it ages with infrastructure, where a capital reserve would again um, look at specifically replacing um, a, if there was a failure at a, at a capital at a capital level. Um, maybe so. Maybe it's not an emergency where a booster station is lost. Um, but definitely maybe you lost two pumps within that booster station, uh, your capital reserve um, could be used to do that. Um, and then again, um, I, I don't want to discredit uh, my, my team that's there. I, I know Jason Mum. Um, I want him to be available if there's anything he would like to add, um, you know, for the benefit of the committee. Uh, Shannon, if I may, this is Jason Mum. Uh, for the benefit of the, uh, the committee, I would say that when we do the updates every year, as we work to proactively manage the city's rates and charges for its enterprise funds, the utilities, when we look at that 365 days of, of cash requirement, cash on hand, we, we only plan to meet the 365 day requirement. We don't plan to meet that plus 4 million, plus 3 million, plus three more million. We, we manage it all together. So. The, the balance may be broken out differently for administrative purposes, but the rates only reflect the one requirement, if that helps. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, I don't know whose hand went up first, but Councilwoman, uh, is it uh, Romero Worth, did your hand go up first? I think so, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, go ahead. Um, so you, I think you sort of answered this, but I'm going to ask you the question directly. And um, so the prior conversation, I think, sort of gets at this. But how do you decide um, how what the balance is between cash and debt? And I think I heard, you know, the 365 day reserve operating reserve and the bond ratings. And um, is that pretty much? the big factors in, in figuring out that balance? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Romero Worth. Um, yeah, so definitely within the five-year plan, it's looking at these, these operational targets. I think the best example I could probably show the committee is the green bond that utilities did for the uh, wastewater Digest. treatment plant digesters. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so at the time um, it was, there was discussion of uh, wastewater using their cash balance to fund uh, that project, that they would use their cash. And so then a couple of conversations, one with Bradley and, and his team um, on, well, what would it look like, you know, for the amount of bond, especially the green portion. And there was models and financial advice that we took from Jason Mom and his team. Uh, those scenarios were also given to his firm and they run those scenarios to see how does that affect the overall plan. So we take a specific project, um, right, 13 or $15 million project, and we ask the question, right, should, should we fund it with cash or should, um, or should we use debt service to take this forward? And what are the impacts of each? Uh, one of the main reasons as well is because whether we're using cash or a bond, either way we're before the governing body uh, with the recommendation of how we move forward. And is our expectation that the governing body is gonna ask at the time, have you looked at this in all scenarios and what plays out best for the city and the residents, customers of the utility? So going through that exercise of both Bradley and his team uh, from a bonding aspect and, and how that would look for the city, uh, really what kind of cash investment is available, what are people looking at? And Jason Mum and his team about the, um, the, I'd say the mid to long-term effects of the utility of whether they use cash or they borrow the money to do it. Uh, so hopefully that that sheds a little bit of light or, or answers to your question of of our approach for that. Yeah, I guess I'd just like to understand the modeling and what factors you know 
specifically make the scale tip one way or the other, but uh, maybe that's a expertise I'll need in another lifetime. But we, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Jason Mum again. So we do a presentation for finance committee once a year on the updates to the financial plans. And we usually talk about what what's there in terms of financial capacity and debt and how we're doing on our, on our financial metrics. But I can tell you that with the example that Shannon just gave, uh, it's pretty typical of what we do is we're, we're constantly trying to find the right financing mix for the capital projects that's going to produce the least possible impact on the utility rates. And so if we have the resources already from cash, you know, clearly, obviously that would result in you know, no additional impact on the rate payers, at least in the short run. Um, in certain cases, the finan your financial advisor may come back to us and say that it's opportune uh, for the utilities to actually issue some debt within its uh, already existing capacity, which in the case of those green bonds also resulted in no impact on the rates. Um, and it also resulted in the utility being able to take advantage of some extremely favorable interest rates. And so uh, we were able to do that as well. So we often have more than one choice about how to go about financing the capital improvements. Um, and for the most part, especially during the last uh, five years or so, those choices have all been optimal. And they've resulted in very little or no increase to the rates. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, staff, to put for putting this um, the data cards together. It was helpful to break it down um, in the different categories. Can you remind us what the cost from other city departments is for each of the divisions? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Councilor Villarreal. Um, cost to other city de from other city departments is a calculated cost. Ultimately, what does it cost to other city departments and their budgets because we exist, um, right? How many more purchase orders or requisitions does finance have to do? How many more times does Brad have to run a financial model because of utilities? Um, how many vehicles does utilities have? How many computers? So again, it, it calculates um, the cost of utilities being attached to the city and we and so we pay that portion um, even to the, right, to the city manager's office for I would say for the amount of time that I, I take of her um, in meetings and, and dealing with utility issues. And that also includes um, the attorney's office. That was always the example they gave us the amount of time utilized, um, utilizing staff time from the attorney's office was how they, not build, but how you like came up with that amount. Is that correct? Am I frozen or is Shannon frozen? <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, for Shannon, that is correct. Uh, the city attorney, I always think of HR as the one that, you know, mm. the cost to be allocated about. And explain that a little bit more about HR. Oh, all the uh, personnel actions that there are processed, every hire that's processed every benefit, you know, claim that's taken care of. Uh, just think of all the services that, that the HR department provides to the rest of the city and they're hiring, maintaining, you know, city employees, you know, and those costs are allocated about all the departments, but especially the enterprise funds. Okay. Is there like a formula you all use? How do you decide how much is allocated um, it depends on the subject, you know, if it's on vehicles and, and uh, repairs, it's based on the number of vehicles the department has. Um, if it's HR, it's based on the number of employees. If it's IT, it's based on the number of computers, cell phones, and laptops, or, you know, things like that. So it's, there's no one specific allocation for the city. And do you have to break that down, Brad? Are you Andy does. Andy Maybe. Hopkins. Got it. That sounds complicated. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that detail. Um, so I had questions about the operating reserve, but they were answered. Um, let's see. So all of the 
different divisions talk about projected expenditures for CIP for five years and they give details except for the water division. It just says 50 million. Was there a um, somewhere, did you all break that down further for public works? Or is there a way to get that from you? Uh, Mr. Chair, Councilor Vera, we can provide that. Uh, definitely out of the three divisions, the water division is the most extensive uh, capital improvement. Um, as you can see in the note, um, for the past couple of years, we have been working to defer um, a, an increase on the water division. I've talked in the past at several meetings about some strategies that we're looking to implement uh, that we're working to do. Uh, one of them had to do with um, averaging out the CIP. Um, again, there's uh, about $87 million worth of projects identified. And the challenge is um, in five years, am I really gonna be able to complete $87 million worth of projects? Um, I can definitely provide the water division CIP. I can send that out as an attachment. Um, from where we're at today until at least I can get some other of the recommendations in place. Um, if I, <clears throat> I'm using the $10 million annually, um, which comes up to the 50 to kind of uh, to kind of hold the rates where they are and not and not trigger rate increase through the through the financial plan, um, but we do maintain the the full CIP and I can share that. Yeah, that would just be helpful just to know what that amount, what projects go towards that amount or that um, CIP plan. Um, the other question I had was about the two thousand sixteen. For 4% franchise fee, I remember that clearly during our budget deficit then. And in your notes, it says fees supposed to be as assessed 2018 um, through 2022. When you say fee is supposed to be as assessed, are you saying it hasn't been assessed? Okay, I may defer also to Marcos. I think we had this conversation um, I'm going to say now the note is, is that I do assess that fee every year. Um, I know Marco shared the language of the ordinance with me, um, but I would not claim to be the expert on that and, and definitely don't want to put them on the spot. But I know that we had a conversation on that specific ordinance. If Marco says anything you want to add. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I, that, that is uh, the current practice. And, and in fact, um, the, the ordinance that authorizes the transfer from the uh, enterprise funds to the general fund uh, allows up to a 12% of, of a three year average of actual revenues. So I, I'm, my uh, suspicion is that the number reflected there that says 4% franchise fee be supposed to be assessed at 2000 from 2018 through 2022 reflects the actual amount of the imposition of the franchise fee at 4% rather than up to the 12% allowed by the ordinance. So in this case, the 4% has been assessed, has been taken since that ordinance was passed, but we've kept it at 4% is what you're saying versus- That's my understanding, yes. Okay, so that 1.6, is that a yearly assessment? It, that... Yes, it is. That okay. is annual. Annual, got it. Okay, so 1.6 million annually that comes from the 4% franchise fee. That goes to general fund? Uh, Chairman Council Viero, that is correct. Okay, Just, all right, checking with that. Um, and then the other thing I had mentioned when I was at, Public Works. I was just curious. It's it's hard for me to like wrap my head around amounts that we say 0.14 million, 1.43 million. What is that in like hundred hundred thousand dollars? What is? And if you don't have to tell me now if you don't know, but I'm just curious. Like the 0 0.143, 0 0.1 million, 0 0.4. I'm just curious if you could break that down. If we see this in an, I don't know if this is going to the governing body or this is just a presentation, um, but it would help me know what those numbers are because that doesn't mean anything to me, 0.143 million. 
Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Guerrero, I, I appreciate that feedback. Uh, thank you very much. Point one, point one million is a hundred thousand dollars. So point one four three would be one hundred and forty three thousand. How can we just don't put that? <laughs> Seems easier um, to understand. Because um, we're, um, I think it's just perspective. Um, getting the width of the table columns right to fit um, typically would be. Um, I'd usually drop zeros to make it to make the column width fit, but. Um, but it's definitely something I take into consideration and, and I can work on that. There's other, there's other strategies. Okay, well, thanks for clearing that, clearing that up for me because I couldn't figure out what it would be. Um, I think that's it. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions from the committee or the counselors? Okay, then I believe that concludes our presentation. Shannon and staff, thank you so much um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to our items that were pulled off of the consent calendar. The first was item B, which was a request for the approval of a restated and amended joint powers agreement establishing the regional coalition of Los Alamos National Laboratories communities by and among the incorporated county of Los Alamos, the city of Santa Fe, Santa Fe County, the city of Española, Rio Riba County, the town of Taos, Taos County, and the sovereign government of the Pueblo of Okeawinga and the Pueblo of Jemez. Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure which staff is on with us for this. I guess Kyle. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, we've got Kyle with us. And then if we can have a participant promoted to a panelist. Uh, we do have Councillor David Israelovitz from Los Alamos, who is a member of the Regional Coalition of Lionel Communities on with us to help present. Okay, great. Uh, Councilwoman Villarreal. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that Kyle um, helped with this process. And I also feel bad for him too, because it's really not in his wheelhouse to have to deal with this. And with all the understandings of this um, coalition and our and our um, membership, et cetera. Um, I guess I was just trying to understand. We we heard this in a very. Um, it was not complete when we heard it in July at the quality of life um, meeting last year, and so I'm just what was trying to figure out what the delay was in getting this getting this back to us with the updated JPA. Mr. Chair, Counselor, um, I, I do apologize. I take full responsibility of that uh, taking so long. Um, as you're aware, uh, we've been quite busy in uh, emergency management um, this year, uh, but we were we did take some time to go back and forth to better understand the JPA, to see the history of it, um, as there has been some staff changes on the um, coalition on the city's part. Um, and that is why we've uh, invited our guest speaker as well to be able to help answer any of the questions. Um, at the time when we brought it to quality of life, we did not have all of the documentations needed um, for the membership dues and to properly display the cost that it is associated with being a member, um, which is the $10,000 per year. So um, that and, and any of the questions posed in quality of life have been addressed in the memo that was included in this packet. Um, but we, we did want to make sure that we had all of the information and the guest speaker uh, tonight to be able to answer any of the questions moving forward as well. Um, I know Marcos Martinez was on for the last, um, and I think that he was on, or if he is able to stay on for this item as well, um, he's been involved in some of the conversations as well. Okay, thank you. And so the JPA updated one, updated version, they finalized that within the coalition and their board last year. So, so we're getting it this year, but are you, are you saying all the existing members have already completed the JPA and they already, it went through an approval process through their own um, individual municipalities or tribal communities or I think counties? Mr. Chair, Councillor, um, I'm not sure as to which have specifically adopted this revised JPA. I'm not sure if our guest speaker has the 
specificities on that. Is, I don't know if David or Councillor Garcia knows that answer. Uh, Councillor Israelovitz, do you wanna confirm? I, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I'm almost positive that all members of the regional coalition have signed, but Councillor Israelovitz can confirm or deny that. Um, sure. Yes, um, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Villarreal. Um, we have uh, the uh, most recent uh, member who has communicated to us that they've approved the, the revised JPA is the Pueblo of Okea Wingate. So with the city of Santa Fe um, is left to approve and then the um, Jemez Pueblo are the, only, um, are the only two remaining that have not uh, communicated approval to us. And so is there an opportunity to, from our point of view, revise the JPA for each unique um, jurisdiction? Can they make amendments or change, make any, um, yeah, amendments to the JPA? Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chair, Council Villarreal, um, I guess that would be a question for our, our um, legal counsel. This has come up before uh, with, uh, uh, okay, Wingo Pueblo wanted to uh, make some, some changes that uh, I believe are uh, Scrivener changes or something like that that are minor, um, but should, my understanding, and I guess it uh, would be that if we need to make substantial changes, then it would have to go back to all the member um, for their, for their approval. Um. Um, so, Councillor Irrele is relevant. Sorry, I don't want to mess up your last name. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, any changes that jurisdictions make, it would have to go through the rest of the membership for approval. So, when you're saying that one of the Pueblos was considering an amendment, does that go back to the rest of the uh, 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 no, uh, uh, Councillor Villarreal, because those those changes were uh, were minor um, word changes that did not change the the responsibilities and obligations and, and structure of the of the uh, organization. Then um, our understanding was that uh, from from um, Ms. Long, our legal counsel, is that that did not have to go back to to approval by everybody else. But if there are substantive changes, then yes, that, that, uh, that would have to go back. That's, uh, I'm just relaying that that was a conversation that we had at, at the time. Um, so that it is my understanding. Okay, thank you for that. And so did you all find a new fiscal agent? I know that there's been some changes, um, somewhat of challenges in the past few years. And then there was a new fiscal agent selected did you all no. figure out who that was going to be now? Well, um, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilor Villarreal, uh, that is one of the issues that we need to address with the restated JPA right now. The current JPA um, names Los Alamos County specifically as the fiscal agent. Right. So this restated JPA allows uh, any, any member um, governmental entity to be the, the fiscal agent. Um, so no, we have not changed fiscal agents at, at this point um, because of because we're still governed by the current, uh, the current JPA. Okay. And then you all also don't have a, an executive director at the moment or did you hire somebody already? Uh, no, unfortunately we don't. Um, we had a... Uh, request for proposals for executive director services. And uh, we, did not, we did not get um, the response that we were expecting. One of the, one of the issues um, uh, is that uh, we have lapsed our uh, application for uh, a grant that would help support the executive director. So right now our, our current uh, membership uh, contributions only uh, uh, allow us to have a half-time, roughly half-time executive director. 
And uh, personally, I think that that was one of the reasons why we did not get a satisfactory response. But uh, we're hoping that once uh, we are set to reapply for that grant and we can make a commitment for that funding source that, that we'll be able to, to get more, um, a better response. And Councillor, is that um, is that the DOE grant that provides, I think in the past it was $100,000 from DOE? Is that the same grant you're referring to? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, Councillor Villarreal, that is, that is correct. That is and correct. has it paid 100,000 or is it? It has, um, yes, it's been $100,000 uh, per year. Um, okay. Um, I think what's troubled me through, since I've been on council, is that we remain as a member of this coalition Yet we never really, we never have received any updates about accomplishments, um, even as much as like a budget saying this is how much we actually um, are providing to do this coalition, to have a coalition, and what percentage actually comes from the members. Um, you know, I haven't even really seen anything about like what we're there for um, to leverage funds and to influence um, decision making. And I haven't seen any update about how we've influenced federal or state government decision making um, as it relates to say environmental cleanup um, or even economic development. So it leaves me to think, well, what are we doing? <laughs> Why is it important that we are part of this coalition and the JPA lists things like I feel like they're more aspirational but when it comes down to like what happens every every single year or in a period of time that we've been part of this what has been the benefit to the coalition as it relates to its relationship with DOE and also the lab at Lanel and also like how does it benefit the city of Santa Fe and its residents and so we have membership from our council council members that sit on this, yet I feel like it's challenging for people that that are supposed to be representing us to get that information too. And it's not putting blame on any counselors that have served on it, served on this. It's just never has been clear to me about the benefits and how it's actually upholding the things and the values that we care about for the city of Santa Fe. And you've probably seen or maybe read some of the resolutions that we've upheld about reduction of plutonium pit production and all these other factors about environmental cleanup and those values that we care about. I just never see it in a written way or explanation about what's the benefit. Um, and I don't know if really you have time to, to break that down for us. I actually yeah. think it would be helpful if somebody provided us some kind of like successes of why it's important to be part of this other than what the JPA says, which is I think very much boilerplate language. Mm -hmm. So that's where I struggle and, and I've struggled since I've sat on this council. And then I hear from community members that also have you know, issues about how could we better serve our communities, um, the people that are affected by the lab, the people that work for the lab, um, and just think about like how to better serve them versus having elected officials sit on this board. Mm -hmm. um, and then what do we do? And then unfortunately, all the stuff that we have heard has been negative that have come in the paper about how our funding has been utilized. And it's not been a good scenario for me. And so I'm just trying to figure out, I don't think we have time to really give a whole breakdown tonight about how this has this is serving the public and it's serving the people of Santa Fe um, and what are the benefits. And so I don't think we got there last year and then the JPA um, never came back to us and I'm not blaming staff. I feel like we never really had a point of a key point, a key staff person to, to direct this through. So that, that was also a challenge, but I also have seen and heard that RCLC has had very inconsistent leadership and um, for a while there, you all didn't have quorums for meetings. I know it got back on track maybe in January, but all of these things combined just make me very wary about our role in relationship. 
And although some people may say, oh, $10,000 or 20,000 in this case that we're putting in to, for a membership um, is not that much money. Well, it is because it's taxpayer money. And also we're not really showing the public what is the, the value of being part of this coalition. So I'm gonna stop there. I have other questions, but I think it would help for the next iteration when this goes to, I think council's the next step, which by the way, I'm curious why it didn't go back to quality of life because we never actually voted on it. And so it, it didn't get back to us in that um, committee. So maybe someone can answer that question for me. Chair, Councillor, uh, I apologize. Um, this uh, occurrence has come through a couple of times for, for me through other meetings that have not been um, public meetings. So um, I was unaware that it needed to go back to quality of life and we can certainly get that back on the, the calendar for that and then push back the um, governing body meeting to ensure that it makes it through the, the councils. Um, would you prefer a, a presentation or a written document expressing the uh, the benefits of the coalition, coalition's membership and Santa Fe's membership yields? I think a written presentation would be warranted. Um, sorry, written report, but then a presentation could be helpful. And I would leave it up to the chair of quality of life to see if that makes sense to go back. It's just that I was trying to figure out, we're going to see it again at council. Um, and between that time period, if you all think you can put together some kind of presentation, I think that would be helpful. And I'll, I'll leave it up to the chair to decide if we wanted to go back to quality of life. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Villarreal, would, um, would it be appropriate for me to very briefly answer some of the, the, the questions you, you had or? Um... Uh, Councilwoman Villarreal, would you want, the, do you want to have your questions answered or what do you want to do? Well, I'm conflicted because we're always trying to figure out what are the best conversations to have in each of these committees. And uh, my questions are not necessarily of, the, a finan of a financial nature. And most of them are of quality of life issues. So then I feel like that would have been more appropriate maybe for quality of life to have that kind of conversation. So I, I don't know, I, I, would, I did wanna hear from my colleagues. I don't, I don't know, Mr. Mr. Chair, what are you thinking? What do you uh, think well, would be best? Um, let's hear from uh, Councilwoman Cassette Sanchez. Let's see what her questions are. Councilwoman Lindell has questions and then we can decide if maybe we wanna recommend it go back to quality of life or um, or if we want to continue with the discussion. Uh, so Councilwoman Cassette Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, Councilman Lindell did have her hand up first, so I will respect oh, the sorry. order of yellow hands. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't Need, really need to draw this out a lot. The only question that I really have and um, the information can be gotten to us. I, what I would like to see is um, maybe the last two years of uh, finances from this organization. How the money's spent, what are we doing with it? I know we're not talking about a huge amount of money, um, but if I can see the finances, I'll know what this group uh, spends their time doing and and what what is accomplished with it. So um, Kyla, uh, I guess it's Councillor Garcia that is the member or representative. Perhaps if you could get those um, and um, have those at, uh, for us prior to the, um, I don't know if this is gonna be sent back to a committee or not, but if it goes forward to governing body, if we could have those in our governing body packet, that would be great. That's all I have, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Councilwoman Cassette Sanchez. Sure. Um, honestly, my my questions uh, and comments are on the same line of just understanding the value of the money, the value of the time. Our counselors' times are, you know, is, is precious and. Um, understanding how being a member of this coalition benefits our community. Um, you know, and looking at all the different areas that are outlined in the JPA, looking at the environment, looking at economic development, that's, you know, frequently the 
discussion around LANL is the economic impact to the area. Um, and so how we might be able to understand that impact to um, our community, to the city of Santa Fe, that would be very helpful. Um, so again, you know, this is an interest that I think many of us have, whether this is the correct place for that discussion, we are not voting necessarily on paying the membership fee as it has already been paid. Um, but it, it is the question of is what is our investment getting us both um, financial and the time investment of currently Councilor Garcia. So thank you. Okay, well, our, uh, we do have authority to approve um, the, the request. It is scheduled to go to the governing body on the 10th. Uh, we could recommend it goes back to quality of life before the 10th, or we let it go forward to the governing body without a recommendation from finance. Um, uh, what would the committee like to do? Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilwoman Romero Worth. Since we have the counselor from Los Alamos here with us um, and he's taken the time to be here, I, I would like to hear briefly uh, his responses to some of the questions. Um, and I think being a fellow counselor, uh, he, he knows how to do that in a way that will fit the time we have here um, tonight. So I think that might be instructive for us. Okay, sure. Let's hear from uh, Councillor Israelovitz. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Romero Worth. Um, I guess I, I share your frustration in that uh, there are things that we wish we could have spent our time on over the last year or so. Um, some of them were to uh, look over um, uh, our finances, to get the restated JPA uh, presented to different um, um, governmental entities, uh, uh, getting our, frankly, getting our house in, in order. Uh, but I can point, uh, but I can point to the accomplishments that were done in prior years. And I think that's a good indication where we, where we might go, uh, what, where I look forward to uh, being in the future. So um, I guess the analogy I would make is, uh, and, and I appreciate that Council Romero Worth is here, uh, Los Alamos and City of Santa Fe both belong to the Municipal League, uh, New Mexico Municipal League. And what we look for are areas in um, taxation, law enforcement, infrastructure, whatever things that might be common to all our, our uh, cities and towns in New Mexico and present those to the legislature. Um, and through the National League of Cities, uh, federal, uh, federal things are, are important, important to us. Uh, we could do it individually. Los Alamos County has their own um, lobbyist, uh, Mr. Scanlon, and, and we work with federal um, um, delegation and so does the city of Santa Fe, I'm sure. Um, but it's but if there are issues that span a group in northern New Mexico that is inter interacts with the laboratory that has um, people that work there or environmental issues that are important to them, um, it's, it's stronger to have that common voice. And there have been many uh, situations where that common voice has really been, uh, been uh, effective. One example I can give you is when the laboratory was changing uh, contracts. And there was a question as to whether what their community commitment plan might be. Um, the former executive director, Ms. Uh, uh, Andrea Romero was actually very um, energetic and effective in making sure that all the bidders understood the importance of having a, a community um, involvement. And I think that was very successful in, in, in the successful bidder, including that commitment. So that's just, uh, one example I can I can point to, and where we could have all kind of pulled individually, but um, I think it was more um, more impactful. And also, some of the smaller communities probably don't have the resources that City of Santa Fe and um, and Los Alamos County have to to have that impact. So, we if we can count on on the City of Española and Town of Taos and and the surrounding counties and and pueblos then I think that's a very powerful voice and we should kind of pull, uh, you know, all, all hands on deck on, on some of these critical issues, whether it's um, funding for, for federal funding for environmental uh, cleanup or 
uh, a commitment to workforce development uh, that goes from our community colleges down to uh, having uh, K through 12 that, that, prom that pr uh, encourages our youth to get into fields that would be relevant to the laboratory. So there's a lot of things that we can work on together and we have historically uh, worked on together. And I, I apologize that, uh, uh, that our past executive director did not go around to each of the communities. Um, uh, but I guess in, in his defense, um, there were a lot of things that were kind of high. The highest priority was trying to make sure that we satisfied the requirements of the state auditor's office. And I don't want to re revisit the issue, the, the, the past, but but uh, that was kind of uh, our charge to, to him was um, get all these things under, um, make sure that we have, have clean audits and financials. Um, and uh, Councillor Lindell will make sure to get that information to you. Um, so that's, that's been um, the theme and purpose of the, uh, of the regional coalition of Latin communities. And I think historically it has, it has been a powerful, um, effective voice. So I hope that briefly answers some of your questions. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councilwoman Romero Worth, did you have anything else? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I, I know that, that this group has um, had some struggles uh, in the last few years, and certainly the pandemic hasn't helped in terms of being able to, as the counselor says, get their house in order. Um, but I do think that Santa Fe, Santa Fe's proximity to Los Alamos, the fact that Los Alamos has just opened uh, uh, an office here in, in the city um, and the really important nature of a variety of issues um, that uh, present themselves with that, uh, with that proximity to Santa Fe. Um, I, I think it's important that we participate uh, in this organization and I, I hope that um, they will get their house in order and that we will, um, you know, start to to see the benefits of our of our membership, I think it is a, uh, an important place for us to have a conversation um, about the many issues that um, present themselves. And so, um, you know, if if the committee thinks it should go back to quality of life, fine. I don't, not exactly sure what we're going to do there, um, but uh, you know, happy to to have it on the agenda if that's what my colleagues want to do. But um, I also think that, you know, it might be better if, if we just move this on to governing body and let's approve it and let's let the coalition uh, go back and, and get to work on uh, uh, performing at a higher level. And uh, especially since we do seem to be uh, uh, kind of the, the last uh, couple entities to to keep them from, from moving on to some of the real challenges that they have. So uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Villarreal. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that there, it's not about not necessarily being at the table it's just trying to understand over the years, like what, how has it benefited our city and is it meeting the values that we have that we actually express in our resolutions? And I am still on the fence about that. I'm still not convinced about that. And the other thing is I'm very disappointed that from a financial standpoint is that we hadn't approved this and it was still in process and staff went ahead and paid for our membership dues. And to me, that doesn't make sense if we wanna make sure that this is the right path we wanna take, that we still wanna be a member, that this, you know, that we wanna approve the JPA, that we don't have any changes. And then to make, to go ahead and, and pay for that just seems to counter what we're supposed to do as a governing body in those decision making. So it's kind of after the fact. Um, and that's disappointing to me. I think 
at this point, I'd like to see more information about how we're benefiting um, other than saying we're going to lobby in DC and wine and dine, um, that we actually are doing something that's protecting our environment, that we're really committed to those environmental um, justice issues that have plagued the lab for, for a long time, for, for decades. So I'm not at the point where I can support the JPA and I thought it was ironic. We've paid the pri we've paid our membership dues. Yet in the JPA it says, well, you can't be reimbursed if you decide you don't want to be part of this of this coalition. If you've already paid your dues, then you don't get them back. So we're at a, pl a point where we can't even you know even consider that possibility. So I I'd, I'd like to. If the, if the chair doesn't want to hear it in quality of life, then we'll just have the conversation at um, at the governing body after we've gotten more information. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Romero Worth, your hand went up. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, d I didn't say I didn't want to hear it. Um, I just want to make sure that we're being constructive uh, with the committee's time and uh, with evaluating uh, what it is you want to hear about about this. So uh, again, I'm I'm happy. I said I was happy to put it on the agenda, but let's just make sure that you know it's it's uh, a worthwhile uh, period of time that we spend on it. Um, I would also say that as to the my 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 sense is the staff probably paid uh, for the for our membership because we approved it as a budget line item uh, or within a line item. And so, um, you know, we, we probably signed off on it, uh, maybe with not without real recognizing um, what that approval did. So, um, and I don't know if Kyle has a comment on that. He has his hand up, but that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mason and then uh... Councilwoman Cassette Sanchez, and then I'd like a motion so we could move on. Mr. Mason. Chair, Councilor, uh, I would like to address that point. The payment for this never made it across my desk. Um, it, it did get paid through the city manager's office as that is where the, the item is budgeted from. Um, upon conversations with legal, um, we do owe those membership dues unless we remove ourselves from the joint powers agreement um either the original or if we were to approve this version um this version as well so i just wanted to make that clarification okay count councilman cassette sanchez thank you mr chair um i guess my question is that if we do send it back to quality of life would we be able to get a more detailed presentation on some of the um, more specific outcomes that have come out of here. You know, I, I understand we're hearing kind of these broad terms about advocacy and moving things forward, but I'd really be very interested in hearing uh, specifics. You know, let's drill down and, and understanding. Um, for me, that's helpful. I understand we've already paid our membership fees and, and really for this year, uh, you know, we're, we're here, we're, we're in it. But I do think for me as... Um, understanding our role, that would be very helpful. So I'm curious, maybe this is a question for Kyle. Um, if it does go to quality of life, you know, what's the possibility of us being able to have a more in-depth presentation um, that's a bit more specific on some of the work and some of the outcomes that have come out of the coalition? Chair, Councillor, um, I do believe that conversation is best suited for quality of life um, to have a longer format, um, either presentation in the presentation section, as well as the updated vote um, in the consent agenda. Um, I think that that would make sense and would benefit the Council's understanding and the community's understanding of what these dollars are going towards while we have spent them. Um, we do need to consider our membership in the coalition as a whole as well. So I think that that is uh, the best course of action is, is what I would uh, advise to bring it back to quality of life and then push back our, I would assume that getting on quality of life and having a substantial presentation will take uh, more than 
uh, one evening to prepare or two evenings to prepare. So um, we'd probably likely push back that um, governing body date to make sure that we're all on the same page and that um, we have the substantive information to present as well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kyle. I appreciate that. And so with that, I would like to make a motion to send this back to quality of life. Um, Kyle, would the quality of life meeting on the, why don't I see one on the 24th? Here, <laughs> when's our next quality uh, of life? It's, so we have a meeting this week, which means it's um, 17th. Yeah, the 17th. And we, I'll just have to, if maybe we could not make it a date specific, just because we do have agendas blocked out, but we'll certainly get it on as fast as possible. And if we can get it on the 17th, absolutely. So, um, and I would second your motion. Wonderful. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Can I have a roll call, please? Yes. Councillor Cassett Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Villarreal? So this is just to send it back to quality of life. Okay, yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Romero Worth? Yes. Councillor Beta? Yes. Okay, so that's the uh, action on that. Um, I do want to clarify, though, that it will not be coming back to finance. Once it goes to quality of life, then it can proceed to the uh, city council. So I just want to make that uh, uh, comment and direction clear for the staff. Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to item F, which is a resolution updating the terms of resolution 2020-29 to extend the duration of the community health and safety task force through the end of calendar year 2021, allow additional task force members, change the task force composition, exempt the task force from certain open meetings act requirements and other changes as necessary. Councilwoman Lindell. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions on this. Um, I'm wondering um, if task force um, are required to operate under Robert's rules of order. It, seem, it seems like they're kind of informational and they're not really, um, I'm not sure that, um, they're bringing forth many motions and, and that kind of thing. So do we have a requirement that task force operate under Robert's rules? Uh, who could answer that? Uh, Jennifer. I can. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Councillor Lindell. So they're from the state, which requires our Open Meetings Act rules. They do not have to follow Robert's rules. They're not policy making bodies. They don't actually need to follow Open Meetings Act at all, but the council, when they, the governing body, when they approved the, I want to say it's called the Rules and Procedures for City Committees, uh, I think the last time it's been approved was a couple of years ago, uh, mandated that uh, for all of our committees and task forces. So it's a rule that the city has imposed upon itself and therefore can be waived by the governing body by a suspension of your own rules. Okay, thank you for that. Um, the next question I would have is, the way that I read this and the way that I understand it is that we have certain members of this committee or people that used to be members of this committee that are uncomfortable speaking in public about um, some specific topics, um, perhaps some of their own personal issues that they don't wanna talk about publicly. And I'm wondering um, if a, a task force like this has an opportunity to conduct some of their business in executive session. Je Jennifer, do you wanna? <laughs> I can take a stab. Um, I don't know necessarily the rules around executive session. I would have to ask someone from legal that question. Um, but I think 
I want to address a couple of things that you said in, in Councilwoman Villarreal, and I think Council Rivera is still on, um, can also weigh in on this, that it was a consensus of the task force that these changes come forward. It was not just a couple of members. Um, there was a general feeling of insecurity um, and a couple of members in particular, some serious trauma and re-traumatizing from the conversations being had. Um, so I just wanted to point that out too, um, that this was a consensus of the task force that these recommendations come forward. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to this. Um, I probably would like to have a little bit more information on it, but I'm not opposed. What I am opposed to is having this come back at us. We've had an awful lot of discussions recently about transparency. And I'm not interested in having this turn into the kind of issue that we've had on transparency at the governing body and in some other committee meetings. Um, I don't think that we get to have it both ways. So I think this needs to be thoroughly discussed at every committee so that we don't get into governing body and have this turn into um, a slugfest like what we've seen recently on transparency and, uh, and being lectured about transparency. Um, so my hope would be that we thoroughly discuss this at every committee, every counselor has their opportunity to talk about it in committee and that when it gets to governing body, people have a clarity from the committee discussions of where they stand on this. And um, that's all I have to say about it. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Romero Worth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm struggling with this uh, and probably for, you know, I think Councilor Lindell uh, has kind of kicked this off a, a bit. Um, I, I completely understand the, the trauma uh, of having to tell personal stories in this um, format. And I think I'm also the wiser now that we have um, installed the chart process um, about how we have these really difficult uh, conversations. And, um, and, and, and then on the other side, you know, the, the fact that policy should be um, formed and talked about uh, in public um, so that we can understand why rules are being made and um, people can weigh in on them. I, I, uh, I guess I'm wondering, and I don't know, I think the challenge here is that we have this, um, you know, this, this task force has already been created and um, we have people who are dedicating their time and, and uh, energy to helping us um, with a really important subject. And so that's difficult. And then um, I just wonder, I guess, if there's a layer that we're missing perhaps that maybe some of these lived experiences um, could be conveyed to the task force in a different way or could be gathered or could be um, uh, discussed in, in, in an added layer, maybe outside of the task force. And, and so that makes me wonder, you know, how are other cities um, having these difficult conversations that help inform their policies. And I just wonder if we maybe didn't spend enough time in the creation of, of this task force and whether there is something out there that we don't know that would really help us. So I, I have to say, I, I, I'm struggling with this. Um, 
and I don't know what the path is. Um, I don't have the answer. I, all I can say is I, I understand why we're talking about um, a different process for people sharing their lived experiences, but I also understand that there's discomfort with um, having this group form policy outside of uh, the public's ability to watch it. So uh, I don't have an answer. I don't really know how to vote. I, I don't know <laughs> how we should move forward in this. Um, and all I can tell you is I'm struggling with it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, can I respond to that? Yes, Councilman Virail. So I would like to say that we did quite a bit of due diligence and I would actually direct that to Jennifer. She did a lot of research of different models of task forces around the country and what they look like and how they're structured. Some were somewhat, some were structured kind of how we were, we are structured, but a lot of others were actually community led. They were not, controlled by the, the um, governing entity. Um, it was really directed by community ad advocates and um, grassroots organizations. And they came up with recommendations that then would be sent to their elected officials. And I'm not saying, I don't know which one's better, but structurally that sounds more like more um, of a, forum where people can actually be more authentic. People can share their experiences um, and it wouldn't be as traumatizing as being listened to on a Zoom meeting or having people in the community not understand where people are coming from because of their lived experience. So we're in a conundrum. Um, we struggled with this from the very beginning about structure. Like how many members, what does it look like? Could they get into smaller working groups and not have to deal with um, having a quorum? And so we wanted to be able to have that flexibility, but ultimately um, I think there's just consensus within the committee itself. I don't feel like they've wasted their time, but we, we did take a, you know, six meetings in um, since November to like start talking about things. And it was slow going, mostly because we're on Zoom that puts a whole nother layer of complexity and challenges um, and build, trying to build trust. And so that in itself was challenging, but we didn't get, um, we weren't able to finalize and get approval for a facilitator to onboard them until three meetings in. So we had a facilitator and once the facilitator, facilitator came to the table, I really, you could see how people were struggling, not just with the fact that we're talking about a very sensitive topic. It has traumatic content already, um, but I think what it is is that we have um, members that also feel like our structure is not conducive to make you feel comfortable even talking about the subject. Having to do the way we structure our own meetings in the council um, and having to do um, votes, we're not voting any at this point, but I just think that having um, parliamentary procedure as a way to structure community committees does not make sense. It's off-putting, it isolates people, it makes them feel like, wait, how do I address the person when they really should just tell us what they're thinking or their input instead of being like, do I call her chair? How do I address this person? That's ridiculous. Like, I feel like that really puts limitations on all our committees, but this one in particular, that's already a bar barrier to people feeling comfortable to be able to share what they think. And then the topic itself feels very, um, it's a sensitive topic. And I, I guess what I do wanna share is that I don't see in none of the committee, the committee members or task force members want our meetings to be closed. We just wanna be able to work out some of the details um, and start having our working group so that we can start getting to those core issues. And then we will be doing presentations to the general public. And also the goal was, especially from task force, task force members, they were really um, committed to community input and having transparency. So we wanted to have community dialogues in some way. We just didn't know how the format could be. And we wanted to give updates to the public for sure about like, what have we accomplished thus far? It's just at this point, <laughs> nobody feels comfortable. And 
not nobody, but I feel like a, a lot of we've lost two members because they haven't felt comfortable and there's still people serving on the committee that don't feel comfortable with our structure. So I feel like if we don't make the changes, we won't have a task force. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Romero Worth. Uh, you are you finished, or do you have more questions or comments? Well, I was finished, except for that last statement. So, I mean, I guess that's the question, though. Did you have any conversation about? I mean, maybe this task force is not the right structure. Maybe it would be better not to have a task force and to start over with a different structure that could get us. Uh, the information we need in a manner where people don't feel threatened. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to, um, you know, the trauma of, of people having to provide uh, on a, a recorded YouTube, uh, like we're doing right now, uh, their lived experiences and that it's putting that out into the world and it's there forever. And um, these are very personal uh, stories and, and uh, feelings, and I, I don't know. I just wonder. I, I just feel. I just feel like we're a little smarter now, having done the the chart work, which is you know kind of parallel. And and was there any weighing about? I mean, maybe we missed the mark, and it would be better to start over and and to look at other structures rather than try to, you know, put a square peg in a round hole. I I don't know. Um, well, I think this has been the first attempt to try to change a structure. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's hard to say what the committee, the task force members right now, if they'd rather just do it on their own and have and lead it themselves versus it being structured under our umbrella, um, under a government structure. I don't know, I, I'm conflicted about that. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I don't know if Councilor Rivera wants to weigh in. I know he's still on, but. Um, I, I would like to get to Councilor Cassette Sanchez too. She may have an opinion on this very yep. subject. And then, yeah, by all means, I, I'd, I'd like to hear from Councilor Rivera also. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, um, you know, I do think this is an important conversation and I am very much in, favor of there being the capability of, of these private conversations to happen. Um, you know, I think the, the one thing I have to say that hasn't really been said yet is that in terms of policy creation, when push comes to shove, we're the ones that create policy. So even if the ideas are generated in these conversations in a way that are protecting these members of our community that we really feel have valuable insights and opinions and thoughts, um, those actual policies that come out would be debated, discussed, created, and voted on us in public. So I do think that because it is a very different topic that we do have the capability to, to bring that out, but that, I mean, that does mean that, you know, in terms of this policy creation piece that we would have to do our due diligence in describing where does this necessarily come from in a way that's not um, calling individuals out and making them feel that they're unsafe? But I do think that that is uh, a big part of this, this process that even if the discussions, because if the discussions happen at a community level, guess what? Those aren't in public either. Um, and then you know, we would eventually have people coming to us and say, hey, we did these discussions at a community level. Um, I do think that there's benefit in it being within the city structure because there are, um, there are considerations when you are recommending um, policy to the city and what we can do and what we can't do and all these other pieces that we're constantly thinking about when somebody comes to us and says, hey, that's a great policy idea. Um, and then because we see the city as a whole and we are looking at budgetary and operation issues that we can um, weigh in and help come to some of those conclusions. So I would like to see how we can find this balance. Um, and it might mean that when policy is coming forward, policy recommendations are coming forward from this group that it is done in such a way uh, to really make sure that we are providing that transparency. Um, and then we, we vote and we, we have to do that in public as we have discussed multiple times in the last couple of weeks. Um, those are all my comments for now. Thank you. 
Um, and before I go to Council Women Romero Worth, again, I would like to state that I I support what Councilwoman Villarreal and Council Rivera are proposing. I'm basically, I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt because they've, one, they agreed to take on this sensitive topic and 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 issue that we, we're all dealing with, not only as a city, but as a country. And uh, they've experienced it. And they're coming back to us and saying, these are the changes we need to make if we want this to be effective and, and real change to come out of it. And so I, I know transparency, that's always a concern. But again, I think given what we're dealing with and their experience and their willingness to step up and take this on for us, I'm, I, uh, I'm supporting the resolution. Uh, Councilwoman Romero Worth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, was there any conversation about maybe um, pausing the task force for a bit and taking time to have some community facilitated conversations with, within and across uh, different stakeholder groups? And would would that um, you know it, I mean it would give the added benefit maybe of getting us through this COVID situation and 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 getting off of Zoom, uh, which to your point, Councilor Villarreal just adds a, another layer in a in a really sensitive, uh, tricky conversation. And I just wonder, you know, I and I also wonder whether the how the task force members feel in terms of, you know. Being the representatives of of their various groups, you know, do they do they would they like the opportunity to be able to have some facilitated conversations to help inform um, the information that they're providing to the task force, or you know, or has that work already been done in other ways? And and you know, are there other people out there who would partner with us? Because as as the chair mentions, I mean, this is not just a uh, a problem within our community, but it's a national conversation, and um, you know, I, and an important one. So uh, I don't know. Just some more thoughts, Mr. Chair. On that point, I mean, on can I respond? Yes, and then I, <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> Go ahead, um, Uriel. You know, I don't, I don't know if the we're we're actually taking a pause right now while we shepherd this these changes to the resolution. And in terms of the um, interest for the task force, they actually have, in terms of how we're wanting to get input from community members, there has been great interest for members to actually hold community conversations within their own network, whether it's with their organization or with their community. And that's what we still wanna do. That was the intention actually, that was what we wanted to do as we move this work forward. Um, I think the challenge has been not having the kind of budget to facilitate these kinds of conversations like chart does. I mean, look at the budget for that 300,000 and we have a $10,000 facilitator. Now that's just ridiculous. We can't expect a facilitator who's just doing it as a like quarter job from, for her real job, but um, to have that person facilitate these other kind of smaller community conversations. So I think there's some members that wanted to do that anyway, even if we didn't have a facilitator, that they would do that within their own network with community members that they already have built trust with. Um, it's just that if we are trying to look at this like a chart model, there would be no way the way it's structured now to be able to have the kind of conversations facilitated in a meaningful way. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Councilor and I, I, com I completely uh, agree that there, you know, that uh, that it's that's why I almost think that this is a bigger, you know, this is a, a bigger community conversation, and we need, you know, other people partnering and playing uh, in in on this issue um, because uh, you know we can't. I mean, there are limits to to our resources, and and that's why you know, given that this is a national conversation and, and an, on an important topic, you know, it seems like we need to bring other people in to help us have these conversations and to help, um, you know, move the work forward. So 
I, I, I don't know. I, I just really struggle with this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilor Rivera. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have uh, that much more to add. I think uh, Councilwoman Villarreal and Cassette Sanchez, as well as yourself, have uh, summed it up pretty well. Um, it's it's a tough discussion. I understand how Councilwoman Romero Worth and Lindell feel. We've had these discussions ourselves. Um, the one thing that I think uh, a lot of people are forgetting is that this committee has already uh, began meeting. So we've already begun the process of establishing relationships and trusting each other. And uh, the loss of, of two of our members, uh, I think, really hurt the, the entire committee and um, trying to really salvage what we have to continue the work and continue to produce results and um, have uh, meaningful discussions um, with meaningful um, things that come out of it. And uh, that's the hard part. And I think uh, to start over, um, we had initially 70, 70 people that uh, um, had uh, responded to the chart, the, sorry, not the chart committee, uh, this task force, the health and safety task force initially, and they, um, you know, we selected through a lengthy process of uh, dealing with many people and, um, sorry for the background noise. Um, so to start over again, I think would, would, um, not anger a lot of people, but maybe alienate some people, maybe people that were interested um, that are on the committee may not want to go through that whole process all over again. So um, it would be nice to to move this forward and, and see how it works. And we have one process that's going through the, the committee route, and then we have this process that's going through the kind of government and political route. And you know, they may yield um, completely different results. Um, one, one way may work better than the other, but um, I think uh, this is worth, worth a shot. So uh, I think that's all I have, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'm here for questions as well, if anyone has questions of me. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Garcia, you're still on the call. Did you wanna add anything before I call for a motion? No, Mr. Chair, thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna move for approval uh, as presented. Second. Okay, there's a second. Any further discussion? And this still goes to quality of life. That's, uh, so I think there's gonna be lots of conversation there also before it goes to the governing body. Uh, so any other discussion? Can I have a roll call, please? Yes, Councillor Cassett Sanchez. Councillor Villarreal? Yes. Councillor Lindell? Yes. Councillor Romero Worth? Yes. And Councillor Beta? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that concludes our items uh, uh, that were pulled from the consent calendar. Uh, matters from staff. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, we have a few uh, updates for the committee this evening. The first is on the $17.5 million CARES Act. Uh, that grant has been fully reimbursed by DFA. So we've received all of that. It was a extremely quick turnaround, <laughs> but a, a successful endeavor from um, the fall when we applied for the grant, received the grant, um, and now have received the full host of uh, funding back to the city. So really appreciate all of the time and effort that this committee and the governing body spent to uh, work through that process in the fall. And of course, to our staff who have processed and, and gotten those dollars out and are using uh, and have been using the PPE and the equipment um, uh, to address the, the impacts of COVID. So very positive news there. Uh, just a quick recap, I know we gave this back in January when we did the final submission, but uh, just wanted to give another, another quick recap of how that funding was spent. 
approximately 8 million for public health and safety employees, about 100,000 for the Midtown Emergency Shelter, 1 million for paid administrative uh, leave, sick leave and expanded FMLA, uh, 1 million, uh, that was about 1 million, uh, close to 900,000 for equipment and supplies to address the pandemic, uh, 5 million in direct community assistance for uh, rental assistance and other economic uh, assistance for individuals, 2 million to go towards the purchase of Santa Fe Estates for the housing of individuals that were impacted uh, by the COVID pandemic uh, and a little under 250,000 for administrative expenses. So again, kudos to all the staff. Um, and again, the, the, the majority of those dollars went uh, directly to individuals or to assist um, our staff with managing um, the very unprecedented, unexpected pandemic that we lived through. That's the first item. The uh, second item, I'm going to uh, be emailing this out um, and sending this to you all. It's a PDF. We started to go through this last year before COVID uh, with the implementation of MUNIS. And then we got away from this, but this was a very helpful format that we had to continue to provide updates to the finance committee um, on the work of the uh, finance department. So if you can see on your screen now, what we will be providing on a monthly basis is updates on different uh, processing of different um, workflows and key activities for each of the divisions throughout uh, finance. So for example, in procurement, uh, what's relevant is the number of contracts or POs or RFPs processed, uh, trainings, you know, the work that they've been doing to update and standardize our templates um, and our web pages for internal and external use and policies and procedures as well. Um, the amount of work that is done by two incredible individuals in our accounts payable division processing and reviewing uh, multiple invoices. You know, the work, our budget was reduced um, significantly in FY21 uh, and the work continues for them um, and, and their workload. Uh, very similarly in accounting, um, you know, the number of daily transactions and, and batches and trainings that, that they have had to approve. Same with budgets in uh, HR actions or budgets approved contracts, budget adjustments. Uh, our one person uh, risk shop um, together with the manager of that uh, division uh, process general, everything from general liability claims um, to uh, post-accident risk assessments. They're a very busy shop there with just uh, limited staff. Our treasury, uh, you know, the amount of monthly transactions that we process from various sources, from credit cards, cash, wires, um, to our fleet shop. Folks often forget that fleet is also within finance, but our fleet shop um, processes uh, multiple work orders for, for our fleet citywide, um, uh, everything from tire changes to for our PD to more heavy equipment, uh, work orders, uh, repairs and replacements that, that take much longer in time. Uh, we also manage the fuel station that's uh, located uh, in the Midtown area on Siler. Um, and uh, we have our admin department as well. So that's Carolyn and myself. Um, and she also processes several internal um, operations and workflows and processes for our department, but also manages um, the agendas of the finance committee and the audit committee as well. So um, this will be coming to you on a monthly basis as an update. If you have any questions on this or what it entails, um, please, we can go ahead and uh, revise this report or update this report to include the information that you want to see here. I think what is really um, important is to continuously keep you updated. Again, we had started the, this last year with the implementation of MUNIS with regular updates. Um, and we want to continue that so you understand the level, uh, the volume and the workload that our, our staff is processing. Um, uh, mm -hmm. On that real briefly, I, and I might've missed it, but uh, I noticed you have number of FTEs filled. I think what would be helpful is if we could see the number of vacancies that still remain. And then also the, just, and then on the side of it, maybe just the total number in uh, the department or the section, because it seems like an awful lot of, of RFPs and purchasing requests and things of that matter were filled in, in uh, purchasing. And one of my concerns 
again, having come from the county and seen the size of their purchasing shops and compared to ours, that seemed like a lot, that seems like a lot of work coming out of that office, which is great, but it would also be helpful to know, especially as we go into budget season, um, if we need more, more positions in certain areas of the finance department. And like I said, that may or may not be the case with purchasing, but um, this information is very helpful as we start to make those decisions. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, we can provide that information. I think it's really um, important to highlight that during the FY21 budget, we did request uh, one extra position in the procurement division because of these conversations uh, with the committee in the last few years. We were able to fill that position. So we now have four full-time employees the county, um, to your uh, earlier point, is about uh, is their budget is uh, much lower than the city's, and they have about double. They have about eight or nine people in their procurement office to process uh, a budget and op uh, manage operations um, that are much smaller. So, um, that being said, again, if there's any other information or questions that you have, once you do get this information, please let me know, and we can have the uh, staff available for review with you. Um, the next update that I have is regarding the FY20 audit. So I'm gonna share this with you. This is another document that I will be emailing to the committee. Uh, this was a communication that we sent to Brian uh, Cologne, the state auditor, um, as he requested with an FY20 status update. Uh, the update here that he requested is the timeline for our FY20 um, audit. We started uh, back in October with our entrance conference uh, for the city leadership and the chairs of our committees um, and CLA as well. Um, the next step, uh, we did acknowledge at that point that we were not going to meet the December OSA deadline for submitting the audit. So we did communicate with the OSA that we would be um, a, a submitting the FY20 audit by March 31st. Uh, that communication was provided in writing to the OSA. Um, we have continuously since the fall, since September, been meeting uh, with uh, the, um, the staff from our external auditor, uh, CLA. Uh, we meet weekly to be able to update them, to answer any questions that they have, to be able to give them uh, highlights of some of the challenges that we are having to ensure they have the appropriate access to our systems, uh, both E1 and MUNIS. Um, and that they're having no technical issues. Um, uh, Mid-February, we did notify um, city leadership uh, and the audit committee chair and the OSA staff that we would not reach our um, March 31st deadline as we had previously communicated in October. So uh, what our schedule looks like from here on out is that our trial balance, uh, which is our uh, used to create our financials and to, to review um, by the uh, C, by CLA, as well as our provided by client list, which is all of the associated accounting uh, schedules and calculations that they need to review uh, that back up our trial balance. All of that will be submitted by March 31st. Um, so the three month review period, uh, very similar to last year, will begin on uh, in April and our Target date for completion of the CAFR is uh, the end of June, so June 30th, very similar to last year. So we have committed to providing these written updates um, to, um, to the OSA as well to keep him informed. And that's, that was the purpose of this particular memo. I can forward this to all of the council. Um, but I think uh, there was a request last week for this update and we can continue to provide written updates as we proceed in the next four months to this committee as well. So Mr. Chair, I stand for any questions at this time. Okay, questions of Ms. McCoy. No, okay, thank you. Thank you for that update, Mary. And yes, if you can keep us surprised of the uh, progress that we're making on the uh, audit, that would be great. Yes, and then, okay. um, Yes. Uh, a few more. Uh, I'll keep it brief. I understand that it's late. Uh, we did. I did want to highlight the FY uh, 21 December uh, GRT report that was sent out in the middle of last week. So let me pull that up briefly um, to discuss that with the committee. 
Um, here we see, uh, these are the monthly reports. This is the memo that we send out uh, that Brad prepares uh, to discuss the gross receipts tax revenue coming in uh, as distributed by uh, the taxation and revenue department. Um, so on this, we, as of December, um, as, you, as you remember, the uh, distributions have a two month lag period. So we wanted to highlight a few, um, a few uh, points from our July to December uh, information. Uh, if, we, if you recall, uh, when we originally submitted this budget, our, our goal was about a 20% uh, reduction or our projection was a 20% reduction in GRT. So um, actually, let me take a step back. We talk about uh, GRT in two different ways, the taxable gross receipts. Uh, which is the revenue generated by our businesses. That's this first chart that you have in your memo. Um, this shows 252 million in taxable gross receipts that have been uh, reduced uh, in the period from July to December as compared to the previous year. This is a significant amount of revenue that our local businesses have lost. So then if we fast forward um, to what the city uh, receives from that, uh, this is the period, uh, this is on the second page of your memo from July to December, that same period. Uh, and we have lost a total of approximately 19% or 12.3 million uh, in that July to December period. Sorry, I keep going back and forth. So from July of 2019 uh, to December of 2019 as compared to July of 2020, which is the orange bars to July, December of 2020, we've lost about 19%, so a little bit under the 20% that we had committed to. Um, so taking a, a little bit of a stroll back memory lane, last year uh, when COVID hit, um, the most severe shutdowns were in the spring when we were closing out the FY20 fiscal year. Um, DFA did allow us those extra few months, so we did um, produce about three budgets during uh, for the current fiscal year where we continue to revise as we received additional data points. So this uh, body approved the FY21 budget in July. So we did commit at that time to continuously reviewing our revenue sources. At the next uh, finance committee meeting on March 22nd, we will be providing an entire um, outlook and updates from the first quarter, uh, update on all of our revenue sources and expenditures, as well as the, um, the outlook for the remainder of the fiscal year. So that being said, we know for the first six months of FY21, we hit our close to our 20% uh, redu reduction in GRT. As you know, we are now in the yellow zone uh, in the public health orders and going towards green and beyond, you know, turquoise, whatever is beyond green and turquoise. So there is a more positive um, projections that we see for the second half of uh, this current fiscal year. So that being said, we do plan uh, to start to bring forward different budget adjustments that um, to be able to uh, take advantage of that additional recurring revenue. Um, there have been other sources of revenue, unfortunately, that have not performed as strongly as our GRT gas tax, for example, will highlight some of those areas uh, where we will have to use um, the additional revenue from GRT to be able to support those other revenue sources that did not come in at our projections. So we'll be able to give you that full, fuller picture. Um, we have also contracted with an economist out of UNM um, and a finance expert to assist us um, you know, with the certainty to understand the trends of the last year now that we have a bit of a developed pattern with const the construction industry being one of our stronger industries to be able to better plan out for 21 and for our FY22 budget. So if there's no questions on, um, on the current GRT uh, July to December outlook, I can go ahead and jump into our FY22 update. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, with that FY22, we do uh, see the, be the beginning of an economic recovery now in the spring and moving into FY22. So there will be additional instructions given out to departments um, to, on budget increases. We're taking a fund by fund approach where each, all of the revenue coming into our 70 different funds will be performing at different um, strengths, some stronger than others. 
And so that will largely guide our projections fund by fund will largely guide um, the increases for FY22. That being said, uh, we will be holding a public hearing on March 10th at the governing body meeting to solicit input from uh, the public on what their priorities are uh, and what they would like to see funded in the FY22 budget. So we look forward to having more communications over the next week and a half um, to get that message out to the public. Uh, they will have this opportunity to, to be able to weigh in on the FY22 budget. Similarly, um, Alexis Lotero, our budget officer, will be contacting all of you to solicit your input on your FY22 budget for city council. Um, this was, you know, we heard this loud, both of these points loud and clear during the last budget round that you would like input from uh, the community ahead of uh, the budget hearings. And also you would like input on your own um, FY22 budget. So uh, keep in mind, um, that will be coming in the, in the coming days. Um, and we would love to hear if you would like to add in anything from uh, travel to supplies, to equipment, anything that you would need to be able to, to serve in your roles and your positions in the next fiscal year. And I think that covers all of the updates that I have for you tonight. Thank you for your patience. All right, uh, thank you, Mary. Um, let's see, next is uh, matters from the committee. Is there anything from the committee? Mr. Chair. No. Uh, Councilwoman Villarreal and then Councilwoman Cassette Sanchez. I just had a question for Director McCoy. Um, the public input, what, what date did you say that was going to be? Wednesday, March 10th. That will be at the governing body meeting. Okay. How, how are we notifying or letting the public know that? that's an opportunity for them. I believe there are multiple um, avenues that our communications team will be using from social media to uh, press releases and everything in between. If there is a particular um, format that you would like or particular constituency that you would like us to reach out to, please let us know and we can go ahead and, um, and, and make sure uh, we send the information to them. I'll be giving a brief, um, kind of 10,000 foot view, a presentation um, on, you know, which departments receive what type of funding and, you know, that um, what our total budget is, uh, just in a, maybe two or three slides um, ahead of that public engagement. Okay, thank you. And so that's a separate item um, where people, it won't be petitions from the floor, it's an actual public hearing. Okay. Mr. Chair, Councillor, yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Cassette Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I had similar questions about how we're getting the word out there. Um, I really wanna thank the team for putting this forward. I think that it's a really important, um, it's a really important part of the budget budgeting process. I'm really glad that we are highlighting it this year. As Councilor Romero Worth has said in the past, it's something along, you know, money is policy or budget is policy. But when, it, when push comes to shove, if the dollars aren't there, the policy is not there either. So I'm very glad that we're doing this. And I did just really want to say thank you to uh, Mary, your team, and to, I mean, pretty much every single staff member for those CARES Act dollars. I know that um, when I was speaking with staff, in literally any department at that juncture. <laughs> um, there was always some comment about the work that was going into getting those dollars out and spending those dollars. Um, so thank you. I know that your team really had to do, you guys do the, um, you know, not as glamorous <laughs> stuff that's not as visible, but is crucial and we can't do um, anything else without it. Not that I would categorize anything with COVID as, as glamorous per se, but, um, you guys really don't do as much of the visible work. So the behind the scenes work that has to happen so that our other departments can um, also be doing the really hard front work is, is crucial. So thank you so much. Please pass that on to your team. Please pass that on to the other department directors. Um, it was a monumental effort and we are so grateful that y'all were able to spend those dollars in such a short amount of time. So that was all, thank you. Okay, anything else from the committee? Um, okay, uh, matters from the chair, just briefly, uh, today, March 1st, 
is COVID-19 Memorial Day. And so if you haven't already, uh, take the time before the end of the day to remember those that have been impacted by this horrible pandemic. Um, I know for myself, uh, my friend Pat Holmes, his dad passed away due to COVID-19. And so that hit pretty close to home. And I know it really affected him and his family. And so um, again, uh, today's Memorial Day for COVID-19. So um, it's also my understanding, uh, Councilwoman Romero Worth, and maybe you can research this. Uh, related to COVID-19, you have, uh, I know you've got quality of life on Wednesday, but I think the mayor has either reached out to DOH or had a conversation with DOH regarding vaccinations and the lack of residents in 87507 and 87505 being vaccinated. And so um, I don't know. And I think he, he put out there that the city will participate however we can if to uh, ensure that more people in those two area codes get vaccinated. And so I just wanted to give you a heads up because I heard something about that. And uh, you may want to follow up when your quality of life committee meeting on Wednesday. Um, so with that, um, our next meeting is Monday, March 22nd. If there is nothing else, which I don't believe there is, we are adjourned.